Okay, great. Right, okay, uh, we'll get started. Um, this is a talk that um, I've actually based this on a series of articles I've written, blog articles that I haven't yet published. The blog, blog articles go into a lot more detail about this, and I will publish the link in the slides when I post them to FOSDEM to the articles. Um, they include full reference and all the background to all this. this so this is going to be a fairly brief, quick run-through of stuff because of the shortness of t I have time. So I hope we'll have time for questions at, at, at the end, but probably outside. So uh, just to give an overview of what I'm going to be talking about, I'll explain why I'm talking about Java class metadata. I'm going to skip over the stuff I had in the slides, but I've left it in there for reference about how you measure overall JVM native memory use. I'm going to concentrate on the tool that allows you to see uh, class metadata statistics and identify exactly how much memory use is being used to model an individual class in the runtime. I'm going to show you what that looks like under the hood, what's actually going on inside the JVM, and give you some numbers about sizes and things. The idea of all this is so that you can look at the um, amount of cost there is in the JVM for actually modeling the class base, and you can relate that to what's given up in any of the stats for your application, and you can maybe start identifying opportunities for actually redesigning the code to have a slightly lower uh, metadata uh, overhead for your application. So I'll just explain what is Java class metadata. Um, it's basically the JVM's internal model of everything that's in the bytecode. The JVM unpacks the bytecode and creates an object network and then throws almost all of the bytecode away. Um, it also annotates that, that model with some extra state. It has resolution state explaining how classes link to other classes, uh, the linkage between uh, classes and uh, methods that are going to be invoked at some point during the, the, co the code or, or fields going to be accessed and so on. Um, it's also uh, updated with interpretation state. There's a, a, for every uh, class, there's a, a cache that keeps track of information that allows the interpreters to identify whether uh, our methods or fields have been resolved and to quickly invoke them or access them. And it's also updated with extra compilation state, code addresses for, um, uh, for, for uh, code entry addresses for compiled jitted methods, linking stubs that allow you to do transitions between interpretation and compiling, and so on. And also, there's a load of profile counters kept by both of the um, both of the, inter the interpreter and the compiler. So all of that is modelled internally as, a, as, a, as an object structure. And why do you need that? Well, if you're going to be running uh, a, a managed runtime with dynamic class linking and loading, you've got to know what classes are in there in order to link other classes into them as you load them. And you've got to respect their visibility and their access. So you need a model of the class base and the, the methods. Uh, the interpreter and the JIT need to know about the class model because uh, you can't run an instruction like a check cast instruction without taking some object, working out which class it belongs to, and then working out where that sits in a class hierarchy. So it's needed for execution. And obviously, it's needed for you to do compiling and optimization to make sure that that's correct and sound. You need to reference the class model to be able to do that. Reflection actually requires you to reify the class model in memory. Um, you've actually got to create an instance of Java Lang class, and potentially when you start doing reflect operations, create uh, proxies for methods, fields, meta handles. So you need a knowledge of what's in the class base in order to be able to do that. And finally, JVM TI agents need to be able to scan and query the class base and maybe update the bytecode, and you've got to ripple that through into the rest of the JVM, the effects of that change. So you really need a, class, a model of the class structure. Why would you not just stick with bytecode? Well, bytecode has a whole lot of things that really make it inappropriate. Um, it's, in order to get at, to add data that's embedded in the bytecode, you've got to traverse your way through a byte array to find things. So it's not easy to access things, whereas a, a, a separate object network, you can index things, you can access things directly. A lot of data in bytecode is implicit. You have to convert from byte representations to, say, an, a number or a, a string or something. So it's not really a good store in the way it stores things. Um, you can't really annotate the bytecode. It's a slab of bytes, so updating it in place isn't really an option. And in, in an object network that models a class base, some of the objects can be read-only. They store stuff that's constant. Some of them can be read-write, where you put runtime-derived information into the place where it's actually needed for you to do things with that class or with the, that method. And the bytecode's very verbose. If you look at a, a symbol like JavaLang object or a method name like add, um, if you look at a method signature, these occur all over the place in bytecode. Uh, constants, string constants, and class object constants occur all over the place. Keeping multiple copies of those is really, uh, uh, in lots of different bytecodes, is a waste of space. So the JVM has a symbol table where it puts symbols in once. It creates unique strings on the heap. 
and it just puts pointers to these things in. So you can reduce a lot of the verbosity. And constant pull data is an enormous slab of the, the actual stuff that's in class files. So there's a lot of opportunity for a win there. Uh, so why am I going to talk about this? It's really what's the motive for this? It's good for people to understand how this works. We always want to encourage new uh, people to hack on the JVM. But metadata can actually be a large proportion of the code in your um, actual uh, memory image, uh, of the data in your memory image. Uh, I'm going to show you an example based on the JBoss uh, Wildfly, the project that drives, uh, we drive the app server from. And if you just boot up an app server instance with no deployments in it, there's about 22 meg of instance data and about 55 meg of class metadata, like just when it's a, a bare uh, app server. So it can actually dominate the, uh, the memory image quite substantially. Um, so what I'm hoping is that um, if once you understand something about how this works and you can get stats upon what's, what the actual costs are for your code, there might be opportunities for optimization and redesigning your code to use a smaller class base. Obviously, you just use less classes is one way, but also the way you code your classes can make a difference. So I'll show you an example of that from EAP. I'm going to skip the stuff about the native memory stats just to say that there is actually a whole memory management system that replaces malloc and the new operators in C++ for creating all the JVM metadata, and you get stats on that. There's one particular stat that I'm, uh, tool, uh, stat tool I'm interested in, which is a J command option to allow you to actually see the information about the class model. And you need to run with the unlock, unlock diagnostic VM options enabled for that to work. So this is the command that starts up the Wildfly server. You run the standalone. Uh, script to just start a simple app server and uh, I've put that into as an argument to start it. So this is the example we're going to be using. Um, you can use J command to find the process ID of that, of that uh, process and then you can use another J command option, the GC class stats option to get a formatted list of statistics on all of the classes. There's about 10,000 when you boot up a wildfly and it comes out as a table which is vast. I've summarized that by put, I, you could actually load it into a spreadsheet exactly what I did to look at this stuff and you can summarize it. So these are the default statistics that are given. They represent aggregate statistics for the class as a whole and certain categories of structures that are used to model the class and the method. So I'll go through these in a bit. Uh, you basically get a load of columns. There's two rows, so I've colored them differently. And down the left-hand side, you've got the index of the class. It goes all the way up to 10,228. Um, on the right-hand side, the very far right column in red, you've got the class name. And they're sorted by default on the instance bytes. Uh, statistic, which is actually an interloper. That's a heap statistic. That's Java memory, not metadata memory. But uh, the most popular class in uh, Wildfly is a character array. And there's about, um, about five megabytes of character array in the, when that's booted. The next most popular is object array. There's two and a half megabytes. And the first user-defined class is hashmap dollar node. And there's about 2.3 megabytes of that. So um, quite a lot of instance data in there. The class bytes column uh, represents the amount of storage used to model the class itself without taking account all the constant pool data and all the methods. It's actually a, one main struct plus a few little auxiliaries. And you can see that the two array classes use about 480 bytes. The, use, the, uh, um, in, the, the actual instantiable class there um, is, is a slightly different structure used in memory. They're all instances of a class called class with a K, a C++ type. But there's array class and instance class. Two different types of array class, actually. And the instance class is a bit bigger, and it has some extra auxiliary data in it because of the structure of, a, of an instance class. So there's about 560 bytes there. There's no annotations in these classes. Annotations are stored as a thing hung off the class, the class annotations, as just a, a packed byte array. Um, so there's none there. The constant pool only exists for interfaces or for, um, for, cla for class user-defined classes. And that represents all the stuff that's in the constant pool area of the byte code. Now, it doesn't include the overhead for actual symbols. They're stuck in the symbol table. There's only one copy they've shared. What this is is, a, is basically an array of pointers to symbols or constant numeric values or indirect references to strings stored in the heap. So there's quite a lot of constant pool data. There's 1.3 uh, um, kilobytes of, 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 uh, of constant pool for that class. It's quite a lot more than the class object itself. And constant pool data really is quite a big overhead. There's also a, tab, a byte array that, of tags to label each element of the pool. So there's nine bytes for each entry. So it's quite a lot of storage there. There are seven methods on this class. That's the method count column. And the, the, um, the, the actual method byte codes, the only thing that's salvaged from the input class file is just the executable bit of the byte codes, so the stuff that describes how to execute the method. That's actually very small, 149 bytes. So there's about 20-something bytes per method. 
but there's actually just over there's actually one k of um, of object data to actually represent those seven methods in memory. As we'll see, that's a, a cluster of objects for each for each um, of the seven methods. So about 240 or so bytes per method. And then the last three stats are summary. So in all, this class is using just over just about 4k of storage to store the actual um, the, the, the details of the class in memory. And that's split into about 1k of stuff that is structures that are read-only, and the other 3k is structures that are read-write, because you need to be able to update them with runtime-derived state. If you go to the bottom of that table after class 10,228, you get summaries. And there's the summary we've told you before. You've got 22 megabytes of, of instance data, of, of objects in the Java heap. And overall, in the total column, you've got 51 megabytes of, uh, of actual class metadata. Um, it, it, you can see there's about 6 meg of uh, class bytes, there's a lot more constant pool data, 18 meg, and there's a lot more uh, method data. And in fact, if you look at the percentages, which are also cited there, about 45% of the metadata is methods, about 31% is class pool, and about 12% is class bytes. Only 7% of the original byte code is actually left as the, byte, as the method byte codes. That gives you about nine methods per class on average. That's, these are not untypical values, and about 250 bytes per method. Whereas if you look at the class bytes, the class is on average about 620 bytes. And the constant pools, on average, you don't actually have a constant pool for every class. They're not for array classes. But you've got 1,850 bytes. And if you think about a pool full of eight-byte entries, pointers, or, or, or constant number values, and one-byte tags, divide that by nine, and that gives you about 200 entries on average in the constant pools for, these, for these, this class model. So constant pools are really quite big. Um, so let's move on to what that actually looks like in terms of what's really in memory. So what you've got in memory, um, for every class loader that's in the, in the JDK runtime, there's a corresponding class loader data object in the JVM that manages all the memory for all the structures for that class loader. And it has its own region of virtual memory that it uses for that, which you can wipe once it's deleted. And there are different types of classes. So coming down from the class loader, there's a link. The class loader data points to the first class. And there's a daisy chain field in the classes called loader next, which links them all. So all of the classes for a given loader are all daisy chained together. Um, they've also got a link back to their class loader. And then the, the three different types of classes that are subclass of the actual top level C++ class with a K are instance class, type array class, and object array class. Those correspond to the three classes I showed you before. A user-defined class or an interface would be an instance class. Um, a primitive type array like char array would be a type array class, and an object array, of, well, array of object array of foo would be an object array class. So you create one of these each time you load something. So the sizes are 232 bytes for the primitive array, 240 for the object array, and 420 plus an extra bit for an instance class because it has there's some data that varies according to what the, the layer of the class is, the definition of the class, and you get a tail which has some extra stuff packed in so it's in one block in memory. So there's a few of those fields that are common across all classes. Everything's got to point to its superclass. In most cases, that's object. Um, there's, there's a link down from a class to its subclass, which is the first sublink. And then there's a sibling link along. So you can go down along to get all the subclasses of a given class. So you can do that to do a breadth first search of the class tree if you want. Um, and then there's a Java mirror. Now, that's in red because that's not a reference to other metadata. All these other pointers are all pointers to other classes. That's a pointer into the heap, to an oop that's in the heap. That's the Java line class instance that represents this class. That's created when the class object is created in the JVM. And it's populated with all the other data when you start doing reflect operations. It's just a bare, empty class when you first start. But you have to have that proxy in, in the heap. An instance class has a few extra fields. There's a bit of a variation in the tail. For example, a, a, an object array class if it's a foo, an array, an array of, array of array of foo, element class would be just single array of foo, and bottom class would just be foo, the, the, the last one be, uh, that's underneath all the array dereferences. Um, in in uh, instance class, you've got a couple of other structures that are hung off it. One is a pointer to all the model of the constant pool data. Another is a pointer to an array, which counts as part of the class stat, and that array has pointers to all the method objects, which are accounted for in the method stats we saw before. But that variant tail is interesting. What goes in there? Now, if you've got a, a, a user-defined class, um, it can have object values as fields. Um, and in that case, the garbage collection needs to know where they are. So there's usually a small amount of data used to keep track of the indexes of those object fields to allow the garbage collector to traverse objects. 
So it'll have 8, 24. That's the offsets to where there's two object fields, for example. Um, that's usually tiny. What's often bigger is the V-table and the I-tables. Now, a V-table is used when you need to do a virtual method invocation. For, the, for any given class, there are certain methods that have been called with an invoke virtual. You need to know what implementation to use. So in that tail section, you have a, a load of pointers to all the implementations that are appropriate for this class. It's either a local method or an inherited method. When you want to do a, a virtual method invocation, you go to the class object, you find the V-table, you index, and that's the code point that you need to call. Now, an I-table does a similar sort of thing for an interface. You've got a table of methods, which are the, this class's implementation of all the interface methods, either local or ones that are inherited. So the size of the V-table is determined by how many methods are, are not, non, not, not private, because you can, you can do an a virtual method so long as it's not private and so long as it's not a locally defined final method. If it's locally defined and final, well, then it's always going to be called directly. Similarly, if it's, if it's private, it's going to be called directly. But all the other methods will determine the size of the V-table. The size of the I-table, you get one for every interface you implement, and you get the size of it is however many methods are I defined in the interface. So that defines the complexity of this bit, which is the bulk of what's in that tail. Um, the, the other the, I'll go through the other structures that are hung off the class. The constant pool, it has a fixed overhead of about 80 bytes, including a, a, all, the, all the object constants that are referred to the constant pool are actually created in an object array on the heap, and the constant pool entry is an index as to where that value is. So if you've got any constant strings, they're not stored in the constant pool itself because that would require the garbage collector to go scanning through it. They're stored in the heap, and there's one point to start and scan objects for the garbage collector. But... Um, other than that, there's the actual cache data is the bulk of what's in, in this object. And it's basically a, 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 a load of pointers which either point to symbols or indirectly identify class method names and so on. And, or have constant values like numeric values in them. Or as I say, they're indexes for objects in the object array for strings and, and class references. And there's also a tag byte array. So your overhead is determined by the number of things there are in the constant pool in the bytecode. You have the same in your actual in-memory representation. Uh, you have nine times that eight for each pointer and one, one byte for each tag. There's a thing called a CP cache. It's actually a, a cheat. It's a little tiny header of 16 bytes plus a lot of 32 byte entries. What the constant pool, pool cache actually is, is a, a cache for the interpreter. Anywhere in the method code for that class where there's a field or there's a method that gets called or accessed, there'll be an entry for that, a unique entry for that um, in the constant pool cache that the interpreter uses a quick access to be able to access the field or invoke the method, and it gets set up when the thing is resolved first time. And then finally, you've got the methods array that points to all the method objects. So every method has an 88 byte. Um, this is all JDK 8 sizes, by the way. It'll vary for 9. This, is, this method has 88 bytes. There's a const method, which has a fixed overhead of 48 bytes, plus some extra tail. And there's a method data object. That's shown in gray, because that's only written in when you actually need it. It's generated by the JIT compiler. These things, actually, most methods don't have them. So although they're quite expensive, you're talking 264 bytes, plus then a whole lot of counters for profiling, they're actually not a sizable part of the, the, the metadata. And there's also a pointer to an end method. That's a pointer to another part of the JVM's data into the code cache, which I've shown in blue. So um, that's not counted in the stats that you get, you'll get. There's, there's also a method counters object, 32 bytes for basic profiling. So um, the two tail, tails of those two objects, the const method, if you have local variables in the compiled code, you need to compress them into the tail layer to keep track of that so you can identify local variables if you ever need them. If you have line number information, it also gets put in there in a compressed form. Uh, the exception table records exception flow. So um, if you... Um, if you uh, all right. <laughs> Thanks. If you have any exception flow, that needs to be recorded in there. There's um, annotations on the method will be a compressed byte, a byte array in there. And the actual original method byte goes in there. So the size of that really depends upon the complexity of the method and how you compile it. The method data has a whole load of different counters, and they're all different sizes in what they're counting, used by the JIT compiler. They, there are counters for everywhere where there's a call, for branches, counters that track method parameters against actual method arguments to do type profiling and so on. Um, so it's very difficult to describe the complexity of that. But it, as I say, it's not usually a very large part of the actual count. So let's put that all into use. Let's look at those stats again. Now, I sorted the EAP stats according to class bytes. And one of the really surprising things that came out and, um, was that there were some very, very big classes. Now, those classes, the, you saw the basic allocation size. These are all instance classes. They're all logger classes generated by JBoss Logging. 
The reason they've got such a big value in there is because they've got massive V tables and I tables. That came out of the way they were designed. We'll see in a second why. And you can see they've actually got loads of methods, and those methods uh, both have both implement interfaces and are virtual methods. So the way the code was designed, there's a class called basic logger, which has about 12 methods, and it has an, it's, sorry, an interface called basic logger, which has about 12 methods, and it's implemented by this class called basic default logger. And it does, it prints messages, warning messages, error messages. And the class EJB logger that um, the code is generated from has a load of abstract methods defined in the interface that are, ge that are generated in implementation. So there's about 475 of those, which, mean, which because there's lots of different errors to report, and they, they say what type of message you need, and so an error uh, log message, you call the error method. Uh, there's a message uh, ID and a string that's formatted uh, in, in, with arguments formatted into it, plus optionally a throwable on the end. So this method here, get manager tx status failed, it prints an error string without any format arguments, and it prints details of a throwable. Now, in the generated code, as well as having the generated method, which is a virtual method, and therefore has an I table entry and a V table entry, um, you also have another auxiliary method that retrieves that constant string. And the idea was you'd override this, and you'd build different locales. To, you'd use, for different locales, you'd, you'd have a different class implementation. So using overriding interfaces is incredibly expensive. You get 475 methods in the interface and in the, the, the generated class, you get 475 uh, methods in each, uh, each I table. Uh, so the one, the one, the one at the bottom, uh, uh, you, you've got a whole of unnecessary code there. And the V tables have, have um, not just 475 methods, but 950 methods in the actual implementation. So the solution that, we've, that we're now implementing is to get rid of the interface and make the actual, dump, the, the actual uh, original class just a class with dummy methods generate an alternative replacement which you put in, um, in a jar in, earlier in the path, path, class path. So you can pile against the dummy version, but replace it with a real version. There's no interface, so there's no I table. That's 475 methods and 475 pointers in the I table re removed. Um, and similarly, the implementation methods, you don't need the auxiliary string methods. That's another 475 methods saved. And you don't need a V table because these can be actually be final methods. You don't need to ever call them in uh, virtually. And they're never overridden, so you can make them final. So you can save 950 times 8K words for the I table and V table and 950 method objects with all their auxiliaries. So it's an enormous amount of saving. Um, Obviously, that doesn't apply everywhere else across the code base. The biggest way to save space is to actually just use less classes. But, you know, it's interesting that you can actually look at your stats and maybe improve things. Right. I think I'm okay for time. <laughs> yeah. And um, do we have time for a question? Or? Maybe one, one. One question. Yeah. I, st I didn't, that's a really interesting detail. So, um, the, the, the static methods have method. What's, what's the cost for static methods? You've got all the, obviously the method details, um, so it's going to be another method object that's attached to that class. It's interesting that static data, um, when you allocate the Java Lang class instance in the heap, you allocate some extra storage for all the fields, and that's where that goes. In, in, the, in the detailed stats, if you look at the instance count, and you look at the instance size, and you look at the instance bytes, they multiply up, except for Java Lang class. Java Lang class, the instance bytes is a whole load more because you've got all the, inst all the basic standard fields of the Java Lang class instances, and you've got lots of extra data for all the extra static fields. So the static fields get stored in the heap where they can be easily garbage collected, but the Java Lang class has a, a var variant size in the actual heap layout. Right, right. So, for doing just one logical class, because it's a log game. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> insane. So, we use the silk. Thank you. 
was to reverse the dependency, the code dependencies. So you turn an interface into class code. Um, yeah, to, to basically just get rid of the interfaces. Yes. So that you, you have a class that inherits the, the default logo behaviors without having an interface. But it's not a bad 